On the 13th of November 2022, a bomb exploded in a crowded shopping area of Istanbul, the largest city in Turkey. Six Turkish civilians were killed in the blast and more than 80 others were wounded. And within 24 hours of the attack, the Turkish government unilaterally blamed the Kurdish separatist groups operating in Turkey and Syria known as the PKK and SDF, despite each of their claims of having nothing to do with it. And within a week of the attack, Turkish jets and artillery systems began bombing PKK and SDF positions across northern Syria and Iraq in a campaign of reprisals. The Turkish president, Tayyip Recep Erdogan, then went another step even further and insisted that these aerial and artillery attacks on Kurdish positions in Iraq and Syria were only the beginning. On the 21st of November, he threatened to order a full-scale ground invasion into northern Syria against the Kurds there in order to establish what he and his supporters have long been calling for, a 30-kilometer deep safe zone just across the Turkish border into Syrian territory that would be occupied and policed by the Turkish army. As all eyes in the West and NATO have been focused on the war in Ukraine, the decade-long brutal civil war in Syria continues. And with this upcoming invasion into the country from Turkey looming, the conflict appears to be entering a new and potentially even more dangerous phase than before that could see the United States having to refocus its attention back on the troubled country once again. And in order to understand why Turkey is considering this invasion into Syria now and the potential consequences it will have on the war, you have to understand a few basic geopolitical and demographic realities around the area that are pushing them into it first. Let's begin with the fact that Turkey isn't entirely an ethnically homogenous nation-state in the same way that other countries are like France, Japan, or Germany. When you look at an ethnic map of the country, you will notice that the Turks make up a majority nearly everywhere except for the entire southeastern corner, which is demographically dominated instead by the Kurds, an Iranian ethnic group who speak their own separate language that by far make up the largest ethnic and linguistic minority in Turkey. There are around 15 million of them who live within Turkey today, and that means they make up around a fifth of the entire country's population. But the Kurds don't just exist in the southeastern corner of Turkey. It's estimated that there's anywhere between 30 and 45 million Kurds who exist throughout a large area that spans across the borders of southeastern Turkey, northeastern Syria, northern Iraq, and western Iran. And because these tens of millions of Kurds are divided between the borders of these four separate countries, the Kurds represent one of the largest nations of people in the world without a state of their own. And that means that from time to time, there have been nationalist calls within the Kurdish area here to create that state that would, hypothetically, be called Kurdistan. However, Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran have all brutally repressed these Kurdish calls for statehood over various different times over the past century for the very simple fact that if any one group of Turkish, Syrian, Iraqi, or Iranian Kurds ever managed to achieve independence or autonomy, it could end up causing a cascading domino effect that would unite all of the other other Kurdish regions into that single state of Kurdistan. If, for example, the Kurds in Syria managed to achieve independence or autonomy from the government of Syria, then it could serve as a free base of operations for the rest of the Kurds in Turkey, Iraq, and Iran to operate out of and work towards their own independences and the greater goal of Kurdistan, which, in Turkey's case, would result in the loss of basically the entire southeast of the country, along with the millions of people who live there who pay taxes and contribute to the economy. And that is something that for the past century, the Turkish government has found to be completely unacceptable. Turkey has thus repressed the Kurdish people within their own borders for nearly a century. They weren't even officially classified as being a separate identity from Turks until 1991. The words Kurds and Kurdistan have previously been banned in any language in the country, and after 1980, the Kurdish language itself was officially outlawed in public and private life as well for the next decade. It is still to this day illegal in Turkey to use the Kurdish language as a language of instruction in both public and private schools, and is only allowed to be taught as a subject. As a consequence of this repression, there has long been a degree of activism within the Kurdish areas of southeastern Turkey for increased autonomy from the government or outright independence, backed up by both peaceful protesters and armed guerrilla warfare and terror attacks. The most prominent and violent of the Kurdish separatist forces to emerge in Turkey eventually became the Kurdistan War. Workers' Party, better known as the PKK. In 1984, the PKK declared a Kurdish uprising against the Turkish government and started a full-scale insurgency campaign. And over the decades that have followed, the PKK expanded their operations and the fight against the Turkish state into the Kurdish-majority areas of Iraq and Syria. And more than 40,000 
1,000 people are believed to have been killed in the fighting and the terror, most of them being Kurdish civilians. Thus, Turkey has spent decades fighting a brutal campaign to stamp out the PKK and Kurdish separatism from the southeast of the country. Turkey has suffered as much as $450 billion in estimated economic losses over the years fighting against them, and they have frequently launched incursions to attack PKK bases and operations in the Kurdish-majority areas in neighboring Iraq and Syria. But for the most part, the Arab governments in Iraq and Syria each repressed their Kurdish populations as well, and so they didn't necessarily mind the Turkish incursions into their territories attacking the PKK. The Syrian and Iraqi governments didn't want an independent Kurdistan to emerge for the same reasons the Turks didn't want one. But everything began to change in the 2010s, when the Syrian government suddenly became no longer capable of repressing their Kurdish population. When Syria imploded into a devastating civil war in 2011, the instability and chaos there proved the perfect opportunity for armed Kurdish groups in the Northeast to finally carve out their own autonomous zone of control, separate from the Assad regime based in Damascus. The primary Kurdish faction in Syria eventually became known as the YPG, and later the Syrian Democratic Forces, or SDF. And after they became supported by the United States, they became highly effective in establishing a large swath of de facto control over the Kurdish majority area of northeastern Syria. But Turkey was always going to view the emergence of an autonomous Kurdish area in northern Syria like this as a grave threat to their own national security. Because Turkey's own Kurdish separatist groups like the PK AK could, hypothetically, begin using it as a free base of operations to coordinate the insurgency campaign in southeastern Turkey from. And worst of all, if northeast Syria became an independent Kurdish state, it could end up triggering the domino effect of the other Kurdish majority areas in the Middle East achieving independence, which could lead to the eventual secession of southeast Turkey. And thus, part of the reason that Turkey has invaded northern Syria on multiple occasions already has been precisely to prevent this from ever happening. Currently, the Turkish Turkish army and Turkish-backed proxies in Syria already control large swaths of the northern part of the country acquired through previous Turkish invasions and interventions in the civil war. But what Turkey wants to do now is to greatly expand their zone of control at the expense of the Kurdish forces. The 30-kilometer deep so-called safe zone across the north of the country that will be occupied by the Turkish army. If Turkey is successful in establishing this zone, it will create a deep buffer zone between itself and the Kurdish rebels and regime forces in Syria, and thus deny an easy way for Kurdish separatists and PKK elements to travel back and forth across the border. Turkey claims, in opposition to the United States and the rest of NATO, that the SDF in northern Syria and the PKK in southeastern Turkey are both one and the same and share the ultimate objective of establishing a unified state of Kurdistan and destabilizing Turkey. And by pinning the blame of the recent terrorist attack in Istanbul on the PKK and the SDF, Erdogan has gained the Casas Belli he needs to carry out the invasion and establish his desired safe zone, which he and his supporters insist will prevent future bombings and terrorists from being able to cross the border into Turkey. But there's also another reason why Turkey wants to do all of this. In the aftermath of the Syrian civil war, more than 3.6 million, mostly Arab Syrians, have fled the country into Turkey as refugees, which represents the largest demographic shift in Turkey's history since the Greek and Turkish population transfers of the 1920s. The arrival of so many millions of Syrians into Turkey was initially welcomed by the government, but it has since become an issue of extreme political polarization. Many Turkish nationalists have long been calling for the Syrian refugees to be deported from the country, and their plight has not been helped by the severe worsening of the Turkish economy. The inflation rate in Turkey is now over 85% and the highest it's been since the 1990s. And just a few years ago in 2019, the euro was still worth 6 Turkish lira. And now it's worth roughly 20. And ahead of the Turkish presidential election coming up in June, nationalist parties in Turkey have begun to scapegoat the Syrian refugees for causing the economic crisis and public opinion has begun to sharply shift against them. President Erdogan himself said back in May that he would voluntarily relocate one million of the refugees back to Syria. But some of his political opponents in the upcoming election have insisted on going even further. Like this guy who says that he will deport all 3.6 million of them back to Syria within two years of him assuming office. Or this guy who said that he'll do it within one year. Nearly every mainstream political party in Turkey is currently advocating for 
for the deportation of Syrian refugees back to Syria. But sending millions of people back to a chaotic, war-torn country that they don't feel safe going back to is obviously a recipe for disaster. And that's why the Turkish government's plan is to simply resettle them all instead into the proposed 30-kilometer wide safe zone that is the prime objective of the next invasion. But resettling millions of mostly Arab refugees within this zone will not only ease the societal pressures and anti-refugee sentiment within Turkey, it will also heavily dilute the Kurdish population in northern Syria with millions of Arabs and thus weaken the Kurds' demographic hold in the area across the border from the Kurdish-majority areas in Turkey. The establishment of the so-called safe zone will also strengthen Turkey's grip in Syria and ensure them a seat at the negotiating table for whenever the Syrian civil war finally comes to a conclusion. Now, President Erdogan has used the Turkish military to invade and intervene in Syria multiple times in the recent past already, and they've all been steadily building up to this greater goal of the continuous so-called safe zone. They have also always happened to coincide with important elections within Turkey itself, or immediately after Erdogan's own approval ratings have taken a dive. Just look at this chart. Each of the four previous Turkish invasions into Syria resulted in sharp upticks in Erdogan's approval ratings as the Turkish army saw victories on the battlefield. And now Erdogan is facing what is potentially his greatest political challenge yet. With the struggling currency and sky-high inflation, Erdogan's approval rating within Turkey is currently barely hovering over 40%, and he stands to face a very possible defeat in his upcoming election in June. Consequently, he almost certainly believes that another decisive military victory in Syria against the Kurdish factions there that will expand the so-called Turkish safe zone will bump up his electoral chances in June and enable him to continue hanging on to the presidency. But one of the biggest problems for Erdogan and Turkey's proposed invasion into Syria is that it will come into direct conflict with one of Turkey's greatest supposed allies, the United States. Washington's primary interest in the Syrian civil war has always been countering the rise of ISIS as best as it can, which shocked the world in 2014 when it suddenly seized control over nearly a third of Syria in a blitzkrieg-style offensive. The United States then began a targeted bombing campaign of ISIS targets from the air, while they began to heavily supply the Kurdish factions in the SDF in northeast Syria with weapons and advisors to simultaneously fight against ISIS on the ground. The strategy largely worked out, and ISIS began to crumble and lost most of their ground by 2017. But the United States was unprepared for how badly this strategy was going to blow back and alienate one of their other allies, Turkey. Turkish and American interests in Syria began to radically diverge because Turkey insists that the SDF and the PKK are essentially the exact same organization. And so, according to them, that meant that American weapons and training for the SDF would eventually be used by the PKK against the Turkish government and their ongoing insurgency in southeast Turkey. And conversely, the US recognizes the PKK as a terrorist organization just like Turkey does, but they insist that the SDF is a truly separate organization that is strictly dedicated to fighting against ISIS and maintaining its autonomy within Syria. This is why, after Erdogan's announcement in late November that he was planning a ground invasion against the US-allied SDF in Syria, the Biden administration in the United States was quick to condemn it for undermining the fight against ISIS. Because it would mean the Kurdish SDF troops would have to largely abandon the fight against ISIS in order to defend themselves from the Turks. But the United States can't really do a lot about the Turkish invasion plan other than offering up harsh words, because Turkey currently holds a lot of geopolitical leverage over NATO and the European Union. With the enormous all-out Russian invasion of Ukraine, the attention and focus of each have been highly distracted from Syria. Finland and Sweden each apply to finally join the NATO alliance in the face of the war in Ukraine, but their memberships have to be approved by every single other member already in NATO, and Turkey has been deliberately stalling on giving out that approval. Turkey is currently demanding that Sweden and Finland each extradite accused PKK members in their countries back to Turkey to stand trial, and that Finland end their ongoing arms embargo on Turkey, which they implemented years ago over concerns that the Turks were using those weapons in Syria against civilian targets. 
In exchange for meeting these demands, Turkey has agreed to accept their applications into NATO. But with a new Turkish ground invasion into northern Syria looming against the nominally US-allied Kurdish SDF, the United States will most likely not want to do anything to provoke Turkey's wrath any further that could lead them to further blocking Sweden and Finland's memberships into NATO, or pushing the Turks even further into the orbit of Moscow. There was already an intense spat back in 2017 when the Turks agreed to purchase the Russian-made S. 400 air defense system, which led to economic sanctions being slapped upon Turkey by their own NATO ally, the United States. Thus, it is likely that if and when Turkey does initiate this invasion, the United States will probably choose to abandon their Kurdish allies and throw them under the bus in exchange for getting the Turks on board with letting Sweden and Finland into NATO in order to further counter the Russians in Northern Europe. Turkey is well aware of this complicated geopolitical calculus, and therefore knows that this is their best opportunity to seize what they want in northern Syria. Now, the other big international player in the Syrian civil war besides the United States has historically been the Russians. Initially, Russia and Turkey's geopolitical interests in the civil war clashed because Turkey wanted Assad to step down from power and Russia wanted him to remain in power at all costs. You see, Russia has a vital interest in keeping the Assad regime in power in Syria because it is his regime that grants the Russian Navy their access and lease over the port here at Tardis, the only operational base that the Russian Navy is able to use on the Mediterranean Sea. This is critical, because it spares Russian warships operating in the Mediterranean the necessity of having to sail back through the narrow NATO-controlled choke points of the Turkish Straits to reach Russia's own ports on the north side of the Black Sea whenever they need replenishments or repairs. TARDIS therefore enables the Russian Navy to operate within the Mediterranean independently of Russia's own bases on the Black Sea coast, which could always be theoretically bottled up and contained there by NATO closing down the Turkish Straits. Without TARDIS, the Russian Navy would no longer be capable of functioning in the Mediterranean with a base to repair and replenish itself at during a war with NATO. And that is why the Russians want to keep Assad in power. If Assad was ever toppled, there would never be any guarantee to the Russians that whatever new regime replaces him would renew their lease to the port at TARDIS. And that could mean their entire Mediterranean strategy against NATO could just always go up in smoke. So the Russians began to massively support the Assad regime's forces with airstrikes against rebel factions beginning in 2015, and that eventually led to the regime taking back control over most of the country. Turkey's goals then gradually shifted over time from toppling the Assad regime outright to simply controlling the regions in the north of Syria immediately across from their border. And so the Turks and their proxy forces, and the Russians and the regime, were able to somewhat cooperate together against mutual foes like ISIS and the Kurdish separatists. That is why in 2018, the Russians and the regime, and the Turks and their proxies in the north, agreed on a de-escalation agreement in Syria where both sides agreed to stop attacking each other's positions. But a thorn any point in the agreement came in the form of the Idlib governorate or province. You see, by 2020, Arab rebels remaining within Syria who were opposed to the Assad regime and not under the influence of Turkey had been essentially limited and contained to just this part of this one province, leading to it being dubbed in much of the international media as Syria's last rebel stronghold. The faction that came to dominate this last of the rebel strongholds in Syria came to be known as Hayat Tahir al-Sham, or HTS a radical, fundamentalist jihadi faction still bent on overthrowing the more secular Assad regime and establishing a fundamentalist Sunni Islamic government within Syria. Now, HDS's territory in Idlib is placed a mere 35 miles away from Hamaymim, the primary airbase that the Russian Air Force has used as its base of operations in Syria, and only 75 miles away from the all-important Russian naval base at Tardis. Naturally, Russia and the Assad regime would prefer to see HTS eliminated and taken over. But there were also around 4 million Syrian civilians who live within HTS-controlled territory. Were the regime to take them all over, it's likely that a lot of those millions would be transformed into refugees and attempt to flee immediately across the border into Turkey. A country where public opposition towards Syrian refugees has recently become extremely high. 
Absorbing millions of additional refugees from Syria is a politically untenable option for Turkey right now, and that's why the Turks and the Russians both effectively agree to keep Idlib as a neutral zone outside of both of their control. The Russians wouldn't support regime offensives into Turkish-backed proxy territory or HTS territory that could generate a fresh refugee crisis for Turkey, while the Turks agree that they would prevent HTS from expanding their territory any further that could put Russian geopolitical interests in the Mediterranean in jeopardy. But the Syrian regime's other major international backer, the Iranians, never made any such promises. After the Russians invaded Ukraine in February of 2022 with hundreds of thousands of troops, and soon after began mobilizing hundreds of thousands more after their sharp battlefield losses and heavy casualties, the Russians began pulling troops and equipment out of Syria towards the more important front line in Ukraine. That left a power vacuum in Syria that has been steadily getting replaced by the Iranians. You see, Iran also supports the Assad regime in Syria, but for completely different reasons than the Russians do. Assad himself is an Alawite Shiite Muslim, and his regime has long been friendly to the world's most preeminent Shia Muslim power, Iran. The Alawite Shia make up a minority within Syria at only about 10% of the population, while the Sunnis make up the vast majority at over 74%. But it has been the Shia Alawites who have dominated the Assad regime's government for decades. And the fellow Shia-dominated Iran needs them to remain in power so they can continue reliably transporting weapons and supplies overland via their Shia militia proxies in Iraq, then through friendly Syrian territory onto their other proxy group Hezbollah in Lebanon, so that Hezbollah can continue fighting against one of Iran's greatest enemies, Israel. But it's not just these military objectives and better geopolitical posture against Israel that Iran wants out of Syria. They also want a rail corridor extending overland across Iraq and Syria towards the Syrian port of Latakia, which, if achieved, would enable the Iranians to export oil and gas supplies more directly to European consumers in the event that Western sanctions are ever dropped or relaxed in the future. And in order to ensure that these objectives are met, Iran wants the friendly Assad regime to remain in power and re-establish control from whatever remains of the mostly Sunni rebels in order to ensure continued Shiite dominance, and that includes crushing the fundamentalist Sunni faction HTS in Idlib, arguably the final obstacle standing in the way of the Assad regime's total victory in Syria. As hundreds of Russian soldiers and contractors have been pulling out of Syria and getting redeployed to Ukraine, Iran and their various Shiite militias have been sending thousands of highly motivated men into Syria to replace them. And while the Russians were accommodating to the Turks and their interests in Syria, the Iranians most definitely are not, and they want any elements in the country that could become hostile to their own agenda purged from any future government or settlement. Iran is therefore much bolder than the Russians were in helping the Assad regime recapture all of its lost territory from the rebels. And they are likely to encourage, and even support, new regime offensives into Idlib against HTS that could trigger a fresh new migration crisis into Turkey. Turkey. Erdogan and Turkey are each aware of this potential looming humanitarian catastrophe, and it is likely yet another reason that they want to invade and carve out their 30-kilometer deep safe zone now. When the regime and the Iranians push into the final rebel stronghold in Idlib, millions more Syrians who don't want to live under the Assad regime could suddenly transform into refugees and, rather than fleeing immediately across the border into Turkey, the Turks could be hoping to instead resettle them across their proposed so-called safe zone within Syria, with the added benefit from their perspective of further diluting away the demographics of the Kurds there at the same time. And with Russia unable to oppose the operation, and with the US most likely unwilling to oppose it, and with Erdogan himself desperate for a major foreign policy victory to increase his odds of winning re-election in June, all signs are pointing to an eventual massive Turkish invasion bent on expanding their zone of control across northern Syria. But Turkey's increasingly aggressive foreign policy extends well beyond the borders of Syria, and most of it all began back in 2009. In that year, a discovery was made here in the eastern Mediterranean that would change Turkey's foreign policy and destiny forever. The Israelis discovered a series of enormous offshore natural gas deposits within their exclusive economic zone, followed up shortly afterwards by additional huge discoveries within the EEZs of Cyprus and Egypt. But none were ever discovered within the UN-backed internationally recognized EEZ of Turkey, which, because of Greece's thousands of islands in the Aegean and Cyprus, is heavily restricted in size and mostly bottled up to being immediately around Turkey's own coastline. 
Naturally, Turkey rejects this international consensus on its maritime boundaries and unilaterally insists, based on its own interpretation of international law, that its own maritime boundaries look a lot more like this, a concept that Turkish nationalists refer to as the Blue Homeland and which could, potentially, include the same kinds of rich natural gas deposits that have already been found in the waters of Cyprus, Israel, and Egypt. But nobody else in the world ever recognized Turkey's ambitious maritime claims here until suddenly in 2019, the Tripoli-based government in Libya signed a deal with the Turks that established the boundaries of their mutual maritime borders to look like this. That deal essentially confirmed the Tripoli-based government's recognition of Turkey's maritime claims, which of course meant that it ignored the usual boundary rules established for maritime zones by the United Nations. It also meant that the proposed Turkish and Libyan maritime zones each cut into the UN-recognized boundaries of Greece and Egypt, which put them both into a coalition against Turkey. Now, at the same time, just like Syria, Libya was wrapped up in the midst of a devastating and chaotic civil war between two rival governments, one based in Tripoli and the other based in Tobruk. Within months of signing the maritime pact with the Tripoli-based government, the Turkish military began to funnel troops, mercenaries recruited from their proxies in Syria, intelligence operatives, air support, and naval assets to them in order to help fight against the Tobruk-based government in the war. If the Turks helped the Tripoli-based government win the war, they would secure Libya's recognition of their ambitious maritime claims in the eastern Mediterranean. But just as in Syria, they ended up falling on the other side as the Russians, who began to heavily support and back up the rival Tobruk-based government. The civil war in Libya thus descended into one of the most devastating and most geopolitically important proxy conflicts of the 21st century, with an unexpected list of countries supporting opposing sides. As Turkey and their Syrian mercenaries, along with Qatar, Iran, Italy, the UK, and United States, all backed up the Tripoli-based government, while the Syrian Assad regime, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Russia, France, Greece, and Israel all backed up the Tobruk-based government. Many countries who are nominally allies in other theaters found themselves as enemies backing opposing sides in the Libyan civil war. And even though a ceasefire agreement was technically signed that ended the war more than two years ago now near the end of 2020, nationwide elections that were previously agreed upon have been delayed on multiple occasions and have still yet to actually ever take place. And that threatens to potentially reignite the war and bring all of the international powers like Turkey back in who want to intervene. The civil war in Libya is directly connected to Turkey's greater geopolitical ambitions and the oil and gas politics of the Middle East and the Eastern Mediterranean. But unfortunately, if I made an in-depth video covering all the details of a recent major war like this, the disturbing, violent, and controversial details of discussing the necessary context and events would cause the video to become demonetized and age-restricted, which I completely understand and frankly agree with. But it ultimately means that YouTube's algorithm wouldn't promote the video to you, and there's simply no way that you would ever see it here. And that's why instead, I created yet another full-length companion video to this one in my ongoing Modern Conflict series that's about the same length as this video that covers the entire course and explanation into the civil war in Libya and uploaded it directly to Nebula. Which, as you've probably heard by now, is home to tons of exclusive, ad-free content like my entire Modern Conflict series, which already includes 20 other full-length episodes containing more than 7 hours worth of additional combined content that you can go and watch right now covering recent major wars and conflicts that'll help you stay up to date on what's going on around our world and why. From this video covering Russia's military intervention into Syria, to this one covering the ongoing Cold War between Turkey and Greece, or this one covering the ongoing civil war in Yemen, and many others. I'm uploading one new feature-length video to this series on Nebula every single month, and of course, the reason why all of these videos are only available on Nebula is because they just wouldn't ever work here on YouTube and would never be able to be viewed here because of the way that this site works in relation to highly controversial and sensitive recent events. On the other hand, Nebula is a totally different platform without an algorithm and without any ads. It's just a platform about great and unique content made by great and independent educational creators, with plenty of other unique, exclusive bonus projects from other creators you probably already know, like Real Engineering's incredible World War II-era Battle of Britain and Logistics of D-Day series, and multiple hour-plus-long 
Documentaries from Wendover Productions. The best way to get access to Nebula and all of this incredible exclusive content is through today's sponsor, CuriosityStream, and their amazing bundle deal with Nebula. And with its current limited time holiday sales price, it's less than $12 a year to get full access to both sites. And CuriosityStream has some pretty awesome stuff that you're definitely going to enjoy as well, like Gallipoli 1915, a nearly hour-long professionally produced documentary that covers what is arguably the most important battle of modern Turkish history, a battle that laid the foundations for the modern Turkish state as it emerged from the ashes of the previous Ottoman Empire. I really can't recommend it enough, and I genuinely don't know about a better deal that exists anywhere in streaming. You get two streaming sites, both with content you'll actually watch, and all for less than $12 a year at the current holiday sales price. But what's even more, signing up will actually help countless independent educational creators beyond just real-life lore. So please make sure to do so right now by clicking the button that's here on your screen, which will take you directly to curiositystream.com slash reallifelore to sign up, or by following the link that's down in the description below. And as always, thank you so much for watching.